It's BYLR. We are all in all the time. My name is MJ in the afternoon. Do it each and every weekday, Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Nothing but greatness, nothing but star-studded is what we bring you each and every day. And today is no less. I've been talking about him, man. We've been, you know, I had to track him down. I had the satellites on him and everything, and he's finally, <laughs> finally, finally decided to call me back, finally decided to get on the MJ show. The one and only Tyler Bennett is in well, he's not in the studio. I wish he was in the studio, but since we're all doing the virtual thing, he's sitting in, in his office over in New Jersey. I'm at the BYLR Studios in Atlanta. Tyler, what's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, Mike. How are you, man? Good, man. Listen, I um I actually been talking about you, you know, all afternoon on the show that you were coming up. Um, you know, got a chance to um to follow you through some mutual friends of ours, um, our friends over at Exoskin. Um, and you know, First of all, congratulations are in order. Last month you did the the Georgia Jewel. You're yeah. is the hundred miler. So is that is that are you officially in the club? I am officially in the club. Thank you very much. Man, congratulations on that, man. And I, I gotta tell you what first of all, what a great place to do, you know, to, to do a hundred miles down here in the south where we're from. Beautiful national forest that you got to, you know, to basically go through this arduous race. And, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, man, seriously, and it's, it's just been on my mind the past couple of days because, you know, our friend Jesse Itzler, he uh, he just did this virtual Ironman yesterday. Right. And the yeah. more I got to thinking about it, like he literally I mean, he virtually went through this thing like, you know, no training. Right. And and the more I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, Croy and I talked and I was like, I'd love to have you on the show and talk about how you went through the process of one never running over. 31 miles over 31 miles in your life to deciding one i'm going to do an ultra marathon during well which at the time you didn't know but during a pandemic you didn't put yeah. it off and how that you know from start to finish man give me the play by play on how you decided and how it how it all came to be yeah so that's a great question um last year i actually did one of uh jesse's ultra endurance events 29029 in stratton vermont and i had met uh chad wright on the mountain chad and jesse are good friends i had the bug in my ear of doing 100 um my brother had done one a year earlier and chad and i had a couple hours on the mountain talking about it and i would say he probably gave me that confidence of push he recommended the jewel uh, it was a local race for him living down in Georgia. And that was really the moment, Mike. Uh, not that I physically signed up, but I knew I was going to do it. I was in the middle of another ultra endurance event, Jesse's event. Um, so that was the moment. January 1st came. I waited till then, told my wife I was going to do it. She looked at me like I had eight heads, but ne <laughs> never wavered in the support. <laughs> and um hired a coach i hired a coach that uh, my brother had hired and you know they had this whole coaching network with apps and uh, i needed it with the crazy life i run my own business and i have two young kids and i'm in the commercial real estate space in the new york metro area so it's uh it's a little hectic so i needed that structure and i followed the roadmap man i uh eight months unwavering i think i missed one maybe two workouts um i just was like a robot building a machine and um so physically i knew if i if i followed the roadmap i would get there right so i knew that that would happen i believe that i visualized it uh, i believe that mindset was probably the the differentiating factor of being prepared and successfully completing it so much advice out there, right? With mindset. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Jesse helped me a lot. I mean, a lot of his programs with BYLR and 30 days of excellence and just his constant uh, mentorship and Chad and others. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to build your own mindset. So, I mean, the preparation physically is what set it apart. The visualization every day, all the time, visualizing the race, race day, the smell of the the trail, everything, and then mindset. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I, I had come from the school of athletic and physical challenges with grit and passion, right? But I knew that wouldn't be enough, that grit and passion wouldn't solely get you through a finish line of 100 miles. And most of the people 
that do these kinds of challenges have this kind of laid back personality and they have the fire in them, but it's, it's not that it's, it's gratitude, thankfulness. So I would say that mixed with the grit and passion, um, or what, what gave me the, uh, the, the ability to, to seek through the training, enjoying the process. That was another thing. And, um, when I showed up, I will tell you that there was not, you know, I flew to Georgia. That was a big, oh my gosh, right. Pandemic. We're going to fly. It really didn't matter, Mike. It didn't matter what was thrown at me around my house or in on the Pinhoti Trail in Georgia. On September 18th, I was going to run 100 miles, and I simplified it. So, you know, the, yeah, fun, the, the funny thing is, I, you know, I talked to Chad earlier this week, and one of the things that he he said, I'd like to, you know, kind of get your thoughts on it because you you just mentioned something that actually I've always, and as as a runner, not you know, not in the ultra space. I've always known you, this is a quality you need to have, but Chad mentioned patience, right? One of the most important things you need to have is patience. And while you're going through enjoying the process, like you were just saying, right? There is that anxiety factor of, you know, I got to, you know, I'm at mile 50. I got 50 more to go. There's a lot going on. When am I going to be done? You know, I, I really want to be done. Like, I'm really ready to be done. And, you know, I, I'm trying to understand like how you settle how you settled yourself to be patient enough to get from zero to a hundred. One, and then two. Explain to me. I've always asked this to everybody. Explain to me your enjoying the process. What does that mean? Does that mean enjoying the highs and the lows? And how do you enjoy the lows? I mean, it's two part question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. You're going to like my answer. I'm not exactly a, a patient guy. Um, part of the reason I endeavored to do this is self-improvement, right? I think that's a given factor for anybody doing this, but um, it's not that I'm an instant gratification guy. I just self-admittingly, I'm not super patient. So over the years, over these events, over training, being deliberate, is something Chad says, being where your feet are, something Jesse says, staying in the moment. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you quickly, my story for my hundred was very interesting. I saw Chad before the race, we're talking. The one thing he said was start slow. So because of COVID, they started us in 10 minute, 10 groups, 10 minute waves. Which is good. Have, yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. Very good. But, but 111 runners over 11 minutes with a 4 p.m. start. Uh, on 1 million acres, you know, they took a small group and, and spread it out even more. So at one, not a lot of people know this. I don't think anybody knows this, but I ended up in the 411, the last start. I don't know how, but I did. I literally, Mike, for the first five miles of this race was in dead last. I mean, dead last by design. Right. I saw the person ahead of me. I could have passed them, but and that was my that was my test. I mean, who who would test themselves at mile one of a hundred, but to see how patient I could be. And to answer your question, I think just acceptance. Acceptance of of where you are, but belief in the outcome is how you remain patient. And I ended up going on um passing forty four people through a hundred miles. Wow. So I think that's that was my way of being patient. And then the second part of your question. How do you enjoy the process? I think it was, right? Yep, yep. I mean, you know, just trying to stay in the moment. When I trained for 29029, I really didn't enjoy the process as much as I should have. So maybe you have to go through that to, to know how to enjoy the process. Um, I When I signed up for the 100, I had said to myself, I'm going to enjoy this process because I went through it not having enjoyed it as much, not for any particular reason. But I think you just take it day by day and soaking in the small wins, letting the losses go and, um, you know, seeing the impact along the way and the road along the way. You know, it's like when you're a kid and you're driving down the road and your family vacation or whatever, you you sit there, you're seven years old, you put the window down and you just wander. Like, imagine if we can do that today to ourselves. And that's what I tried to do. Not all the time, but that's how I try to enjoy the process. Now, during the during the wander period, right? Like I, I've always said this, 
you know, during a marathon, because I've, I've done quite a, quite a bit of those, you know, the wheels always tend to fall off at certain points, right? For me, it just seems like for some reason at 17 or 18, the wheels seem to just fall off. And that's where you got to put the wheels back on, get it back together and, you know, continue on. At what point during this race did, because I'm pretty sure there was some kind of, <laughs> <laughs> as he, you know, and I, I, I see you laughing, I hear you laughing, you know, so I can, I can confidently ask this question. Where did the wheels fall off and how did you put them back on? Yeah, man. Um, you know, for me and everybody had a different experience um, or has a different experience. My dark moment, wheel fall off, call it what you want, was believe it or not, around mile 91. I had a pacer with me, a friend of mine, Ryan. Um, and, you know, you figure at 90, the the adrenaline takes over and you're like, I got it. I'm locked in at 90 miles. Unless you're injured, you're going to finish. At 90, we, we had this part called the Rock Garden. And this was like, and I stand by this, like it was just an evil part of the race. Like you couldn't get enough momentum to run. There were jagged rocks everywhere. You couldn't get a pace down. It was up, down, up, down. It was the middle of the night. Um, my watch had died. And, you know, even though I had a pacer who was guiding me a lot, I, I counted my watch because... I was doing my own math. So when my watch died, that was a little bit of a hit. At mile 91, the feet started to really pound, like sledgehammers were being smashed on them. And um, we get in this rock garden, and it just, that was my moment. I'm like, you know, the little things, like, who would name this place the rock garden? Like, this ain't, you know, like, who would make this up? You're like, what kind of sick, and, and, and like, you know, and then, Ryan, my pacer telling me to pick it up, pick it up. And I wanted data. I'm like, where are we? What's the pace? Where are we? And he's like, it doesn't matter. Pick it up. And those little things that mean nothing um, get to you. So I would say 90 to the last part of the race is this thing called Mount Baker. And I'm telling you, it's a quarter mile, but it's straight uphill. Like, again, another thing that you get to and you're like, who thinks of this? Like 99 miles. And um Obviously, one of the most memorable parts, though, because cool pe- volunteers are there, the lights are on. But I would say those were my my darkest miles. Beyond, you know, during the meat of the race, I never really, back to your other question, I never really grow, grew impatient. I trained alone. I ran alone. All my training races were canceled. This is another thing, Mike. Yeah. All my training races were canceled. Yeah. So I ran, I went from 31 to 100 miles never running in a sanctioned ultra <laughs> so yeah so it was all gravy to me you know yeah. like an aid station in six miles wow music high fives people like so i i was like in the moment and it never really hit me of this is boring this stinks but that was the gratitude part you know look what i get to do i'm in the woods in the middle of nowhere during this crazy world this pandemic look how beautiful it is and so but to answer your question, that was undoubtedly the, my my wheels coming off moment, if you will. You know, I always fall through this 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 one th- these these moments, these dark moments, wheels co- coming off. Call it what you want. And I always wonder if other athletes, you know, just my peers, whether it's a race that I'm in currently or if I'm spectating at a race, if they feel some of the things that I feel when I'm going through that. And that that's one of the things is, is questioning yourself. Um, you know, I remember when, when I did Hell on the Hill, the last Hell on the Hill that we did that Jesse had, um, you know, and that's going up and down a hill a hundred times. I got to same, and, you know, when you said at 91, it reminded me of that. I got to, I got to lap 96, and I got to the top of the hill, and I said, you know what? Screw this. I'm done. Right? I got four more laps to go, but I sat down at the top of the hill, and I was like, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. I don't want to do this. I hate this hill. Why do you do this? You know? So the question is, what do you think it is that gets us to that point as athletes, as human beings, where we just, it, it, like, it literally falls off and we just start questioning? What, what would you think it is, as I'm asking you as a, you know, as a peer athlete, if you would, you're actually a little, a little bit higher than me right now. But, um, you know, what do you think it is that, 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 that puts us in that space? I mean, I think that's the human side and that's where the magic is. 
you know, my pacer said to me at mile 90, I'm envious of you. And I'm like, you, you sick, sick person. Why would you say, you know what I mean? And, yeah. But now I realize what it meant, you know, to get to your lap 96, what you had to give to get there. It's hard to see that in the moment. But I think that's the human side. That's the side, your lap 96, my mile 91, that most people are not willing to get to. I know it's there. I know it's coming. And I know that what's on the other side of that. So when it comes, I try to embrace it. Um, but I'm not going to lie to you, Mike. There's, there's obviously going to be some times where you have those doubts and those challenges. I think it's just the human side. It's totally primal and totally normal. You know, you talked about, too, as well, um, you know, going through that, you know, even before that happened, you know, throughout this whole process, man, it was, a, uh, you know, it's more than just being completely fit. Like you were saying, you had to be a robot building a machine. But, you know, as this biological machine, your mind and your body had to meet at a certain point. Right. Yes. And 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 how do you know when that moment arrives? Like, is it a feeling? Is it? just you know the the performance what is that for you because i'm really honestly interested in I've, I've been putting my toe in the water with doing something like this for a while but you know what is that mind body connection that gets you in that race takes you to zero to a hundred same thing yeah that's a really good question um you know i don't know i think i think everyone has that magic moment uh, where it does connect. Sometimes we notice it. Sometimes we don't notice it. Um, I ran a 50 mile ultra. I ran three ultras in 90 days leading up to this. And I ran a 50 mile ultra um, around my, my neighborhood, basically um, unsanctioned because of COVID. And I was not connected mind, body and nutrition. My, my stomach was wrecked for 40 miles. Um, and in a weird way, on the back side of that, after the race, you know, I'm sitting down at the end of my driveway, depleted and just that it sort of came together then at, at that dark moment, because I knew what didn't work right at that point. I knew my caloric intake. I knew what worked, what didn't work, um, what shoes to wear, what gear to wear. So I think I don't know if there's an actual aha moment. I think for some people, maybe there is. I never really had it. I just, I had it over the study of, of trying things, right. Pushing yeah. myself, pushing myself cumulatively that came to that connection. So that's yeah. you're you're crossing over that, that finish line at the hundred though. What's that feeling, man? What was that feeling? Man. I mean, just a, a pot of emotion. You want to laugh. You want to cry. You want to fall asleep. You want to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> My wife listening. <laughs> I mean, here we are four weeks later. I, I might have been on Ultra's website last night. Looking yeah, at races. Yeah, yeah. I might have been. I don't know. Let's, I don't see, know, let's but... see your browser history, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was, um, you know, I got some pictures and when one of them was my hands on my knees because it was just so overwhelming. You know, you live and breathe something for so long. It becomes a part of you. You know, it's going to end when you do it. And I never really had doubt. I wasn't overconfident. I never had doubt that I was going to do it. But what's funny about this whole situation was um, after I finished, like once I finished at 96 and I got to the 100, you know, at the hell on the hill, that was my last race actually since having kids. But um, I totally said to myself, I'll totally do that again. Right. So my whole thing with you being on that website, it's like, are we sadistic for th like we just put ourselves through hell and back crossed the finish line got to the goal and the thought is yeah i'll totally do that again you know what is that just a spirit thing what, like what is that you know what i mean no man it's completely natural listen if you're gonna sign up to to climb a hundred times up jesse's backyard in the middle of the winter what do you think you're gonna say after like let's go have a tea and and hug it out i mean you know you're the guy that that chose to do it then yeah. did it yeah. So I think it's completely natural, you know, yeah. to, to think it, you know, I look, there's a fine line between that and obsessive and throwing it all away for these events, which I don't suggest anyone do, but no, I mean, 
that sense of accomplishment you had or the sense of accomplishment I had, how can you not want that again? Yeah. How's that translated now into your business life, family yeah. life with the wife, with the kids? How's, how's this accomplishment translated into that? I mean, Jesse said something to me funny, if not funny, but after 29029, which I had completed straight through nonstop, and uh, he said to me, you know, now the bar has been raised. And it stuck with me because, you know, how does that really apply? I will tell you that um, during the process, I think had much more of an effect with my family because I was tired. I was wiped out. I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and I never once, I never once uh, would let that creep in. I never, they'd ask me to play. I play with them, I put them to sleep, help my wife, you know, any way I could. That was more during the process afterwards with my business more now and with my home life, you know, if, if you could do a hundred, what, what can't you do? Right. So I'm tired. I don't want to pick up that dirty sock. The living room's a mess. Uh, my wife wants, I don't know, me to do something, you know, like, how can I, how can I possibly, it's not genuine. Like if I, if I, you know, act fatigued or like, I don't want to do it. I know what I'm capable of doing. Yeah. So I'm just lying to myself, you know? So I think it's still playing out in real time. I hope it does, Mike. I hope it stays with me because I think that's a big part of the why. That is, um, that is something that we can all hope for. Cause I, a lot of times I still don't want to pick up the sock on the floor. No okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally messing with you. Hey, what kind of what kind of pace did you did you hold during this race? Like from 0 to 50, where were you? From 50 to 100, what kind of pace? I mean, I know the watch died at one point, but what was yeah. the like what was the mantra as far as like keeping on track? I needed to hold this pace, you know, uh, I mean, I know about the caloric intake and the fluids and what have you, but you know, were you were you more of a stickler on you know, I have to keep this from here to here, here to here, here to here. And did you? No, and no. I um, I went into it with a, a laminated card about two inches thick. One side was mile one through 50, 51 through 100. And it was an elevation chart. The race had 23,000 feet of elevation change. Gangster. Um, so so to plan a pace, I think would have set disappointment and, and, and micromanaging of expectations that just would have forced your point maybe the wheels to come off mentally so no i didn't really have a pace plan my overall pace i didn't even know this till right before this this uh interview was i looked my overall pace was like 1830 or something yeah um but no i mean it was you know my pacers jumped in when my pacers jumped in after mile 50 they were more dialed in uh, mile 30 to 50, you know, my crew would tell me, try to make up some time. So I, on the next leg would, would hit the trail hard, but, you know, generally sprinting the downhills as fast as you can and, you know, trying to, to hike up the, um, the uphills, but no, Mike, I didn't have, and I don't know if that's right, but I, I, they're not knowing the course. I had never, I didn't know anything about the course, nothing. You know, I had an elevation chart, but for me to try to micro it to a point where, all right, from two to six, I'm going to run this. And I started to like eight weeks before it, I had my spreadsheet out. I'm doing my calculations. And I just knew that if I stayed within, you know, that that 18, 16 to 18 to even 20 a point pace and, and consistent. Right. No breakdowns, no long you know, no naps, obviously that, that I'd make it through. So that's how I did it. That's, um, that's, uh, you know, it, it's funny that you, you did that. Cause most people would, you know, I got to keep this pace and this pace. And you're right. That's where the disappointment happens. If you don't, you watch, you know, you look at the watch, which right. probably was a good thing for you at 91 for that watch to die. Like you were saying, it was, you know, probably a godsend that it happened that way. You know what I mean? So, and then the family, how, how were they when you, you crossed the, the finish line? Everybody was happy, my, my, excited. Everybody, everybody was happy. My poor wife. It was a horrible spectator race because ninety-seven percent of the race there was no cell phone service. Oh, so man. my crew was trying to update her. When I got home, she basically had an update at twenty, forty, sixty, and then the end. I'm like, oh, that must have been hard. Yeah. She was unbelievably supportive. My kids, you know, made me posters and you know the big hugs. And daddy climbed the mountain, and it was. Uh, Great you know, thing. they knew they, they're young, but they 
they know and that's you know they see every day day in day out me coming in for my run you know they knew i was working towards something big but i think my wife was very happy like how was the uh, how was the crew over at exoskin how'd they treat you throughout this race i want to tell you something I, there is zero doubt in my mind candidly that my performance was in part attributed to them i wore one pair of exoskin shorts one pair of exoskin socks never took them off never changed them never had a discomfort no chafing i know this sounds like a promo this is completely unscripted yeah i i tried every single piece of gear out there during training spent a lot of money on it too yeah and and their customer service during the process i mean rick and his crew getting on the phone with me to talk to me for 20 minutes about shorts like yeah, yeah. unbelievable yeah. handwritten notes upon delivery legit um yeah legit and and honestly legit customer service that's all great but if the product's not the product was un. i, I had guys in my crew i had one crew member who said to me are you going to change your shorts i said <laughs> well i don't need to so <laughs> well don't you smell i, I don't think <laughs> i do actually <laughs> I sl- i'll tell I- uh, you probably don't want to know this. I slept in them. No, I'm, listen, I do stuff like that too. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Come on, don't no, tell anybody. I, but... slept, I slept in them after the hundred. I was wrecked. I mean, wrecked. I was. Ex- yeah. I was 44 hours awake. My crew brings me back. I couldn't even eat a burger. Into the car, we get to the hotel room. I'm sitting on the bed. They're all looking at me. They're like, "What do you want to do?" I'm like, "I probably need to shower." And they're like, "You can't. I mean, we'd have to hold you in the shower." So I'm like, all right, I guess I'm going to go to just pass out with my exoskin shorts on. <laughs> I tell you, man, I probably cut that this. out, Mike. I, cut I, that I, out. Hey, listen, no, we're not going to cut it out because it, it's the truth. You don't smell with the stuff on either. It doesn't chafe, doesn't smell anything. You know, listen, Rick and those guys over there, I think they got something, man. So I, I basically wanted to find out how how that was and how they they basically treated you. So it's good to know, you know, from somebody that's actually been through it, that that stuff, you know, when we got on before the interview and you saw the shirt that I had on, you know, my Batman shirt that I had on, I look at that stuff, man, it's my superhero gear, like legit, man. You know what I'm saying? That's like my bat suit that I put on when I go out there, bro. Like for real, for real, yeah. you know? Yeah. So real quick, how's business? Business good? The real estate business yeah. is good? Yeah, we, we're in commercial real estate. We do brokerage and development. Uh, we develop multifamily and shopping centers. Um, and we do brokerage all over uh, really the East Coast. It's it's um, it's lagged behind, uh, but it's coming back. And yeah, business is good. Business is um, like any business. We're adapting to the changing world, but we'll never break. We'll adapt. And that's what we're doing. Perfect, brother, man. What I want, I want to thank you for jumping on with me for a little bit, man, just to chat about this race. I'm looking forward to hearing what the next race is going to be based on the browsing history. Uh, before we close out, though, I'm going to ask you probably one of the hardest questions. If you were to give me one or I'll give you two sentences on what you learned during this whole process from January to September, what would that sentence be? What is that one thing, that one lesson? We are all capable of doing more, having more, and being more. Period, exclamation point. There you have it, folks. Tyler Bennett on the MJ Show. Bro, I appreciate you coming by and stopping by. Please feel free to stop by anytime, right? I'm going to have you on a couple more times, so get ready for it. Absolutely. All right? Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. Back to the music right now on BYLR Radio.